It's it's heartbreaking. I mean, it's shocking. Just knowing who they were, it wouldn't come to your mind at all. You would never think something like this is going to happen there. They've had a fundraiser for Justin Trudeau. They've had marvelous events. Just they're, they're the pride of the neighborhood. He was the 15th richest person in Canada. Barry Sherman was known for battles in the courts over the years as founder of the multi-billion dollar generic drug company, Apotex. Manufacturing operations at Apotex span across four countries, Canada, the United States, Mexico, and India, with a global manufacturing capacity of more than 20 billion tablets and capsules. She was a top philanthropist. I wanted to do something uh, for Baycrest. Vote for me! <laughs> he has to make me look fabulous, young, thin, capable. That which doesn't make you vomit will make you stronger. Now murdered in their home, found side by side, strangled. He had a long list of business enemies. He said, they're out to get me. I'm surprised they haven't knocked me off already. Their murders shook the worlds of business, politics and philanthropy. Mayor John Tory, Premier Kathleen Wynne and Prime Minister Justin Trudeau among the dignitaries in attendance. My parents were exceptional people who loved life. Less than 24 hours after their parents' bodies were found, they were already furious with police. Police broke their six-week silence today and finally outlined what they believe happened to the Shermans. But tonight, a new McLean's investigation reveals another dimension to this story. He was a very combative, aggressive businessman, famously litigious. He used the courts as readily as others used the subway. He was the country's most active litigant. He fought everybody. He fought government. He also invested in a myriad of bizarre, like, out-and-out -out odd investments. Even from the grave, he continued to sue. Yes, another set of battles with the, with the cousins who right. questioned the very origin story of Apotex. I was betrayed. My cousin hurt me, and now I want to hurt him. Did you kill Honey and Barry Sherman? Hi, guys. So I am in another location again. The point is I do have another video for you. I want to talk about what happened to Honey and Barry Sherman. Okay, they were both found dead in a bizarre scene and set up like the way their bodies were and the whole thing is really strange. And there are so many conspiracy theories on what happened to them. You know, the thing with Barry is that Barry was the 15th richest man in Canada. He was the founder of this huge pharmaceutical company called Epitex. On top of that, he had the most lawsuits in court than anyone in Canada. Like he was constantly suing people. And his wife, Honey, she was into philanthropy and like charity work and everybody loved her. Dancing in the coffee shop. Dancing in the shoe store. Dancing in the park. Dancing in the drugstore with Apotex products. I wanted to do something uh, for Baycrest. Support Baycrest, support me, come to the event. I'm not averse to cheating. Vote for me, me, me. First of all, the funeral was crazy. It was like thousands of people attended the funeral, including the Prime Minister of Canada, Justin Trudeau. And there are so many conspiracy theories on what happened to them. Some people are saying it's like big pharma, because there's all these lawsuits with them some people are saying it's a family member because there's family members who like openly fantasize about killing him and then some people are saying it's like a disgruntled employee or someone else there's just like so many theories and to top it all off it's like there's so much information like there's even video footage of the killer or the suspect but then it's still unsolved so I want to do what I usually do on my channel, which is I want to give you guys the facts, then we'll discuss the theories, and then you can decide for yourself. I'm also trying a new format. Some of you hate the tinfoil hat, some of you love the tinfoil hat, so I'm doing something. It's like how I used to do my videos in the early days, where it's half and half. Well, you'll see, okay? Give me some feedback, or if you don't care, whatever, it doesn't matter. Anyway, so uh, the whole thing started on December 15th, 2007. 17, 2017. Not seven, sorry. So the way Barry and Honey's bodies were discovered was weird because their home was for sale and there was actually a meeting scheduled between their realtor and another realtor and their clients 
on the day their bodies were discovered. It, it went down like this. So the first people to show up at the Sherman's home on December 15th, 2017 were the housekeeper, also the personal trainer, and then there was like some furnace technician who showed up later. Now the housekeeper, she says, when she showed up, she noticed that the security system was disarmed. And she said she thought it was odd because in the three years that she had worked for the Shermans, she had never seen their security system disarmed. But on this day, it was. She also didn't see the Shermans, but, you know, I guess they didn't think anything of it. And so they continued doing like what they were supposed to do. A little bit later, the realtor, not the Sherman's realtor, but the one that was bringing their clients to view the Sherman's home, they showed up. This realtor had two Chinese, like wealthy Chinese clients that were international is how they're described. So they show up and the housekeeper lets them in and tells them like the other realtor, the Sherman's realtor isn't here yet, but you can wait inside. So they wait inside, they don't notice anything. Not too long after, the Sherman's realtor shows up. She shows up and they begin the tour. So there's three floors to the Sherman home. You've got the main floor, which is where they came in, the upper floor, and then the basement. Keep in mind, the Sherman's bodies are in the basement. When they get down there, they see two bodies like almost in a posing position, like they're sitting kind of upright and they're like, hanging to the railing behind them over the pool. And this was the weird thing is that both realtors thought it was like leftover decorations from Halloween. This was like December 15, but they thought they were Halloween decorations. Like their minds didn't register that these were Honey and Barry Sherman. So after the clients see this and the their realtors like, this is weird. Like, all right, we've seen the house, like let's leave. It was only then that the Sherman's realtor went closer to look at the bodies and it was then that she realized that they were dead. So she calls 911, she says they're like they're dead and, and that's when the police arrive. This was around 11.45 a.m. They both had belts around their necks and though they were attached the belts to the railing that was surrounding the pool, which caused them to be sitting kind of upright. They were both fully clothed. Barry's legs were crossed, but Honey's legs were outstretched and she was leaning over a little bit on her side. Now, Honey had a bruise on her face while Barry did not appear to have bruises on his face. Once police arrived, the realtor told them like there was a window that was open to one of the rooms, but that the reason why that window was open was that they were painting and they were keeping the window open to air it out. So that that was like intentional. And then there was another side door that was also open, but apparently Barry and Honey always kept that door open. So based on this information that the realtor told them, the police determined that there were no signs of forced entry. And it's gonna be a huge factor in how they do the investigation. We did not observe any signs of uh, forced entry to the to the building, um, and so uh, at this point, uh, indications are that we have no outstanding suspect to uh, be going after. The other thing that to me is so bizarre because this is like a mansion. It's twelve thousand square feet. It's a very fancy home. They're billionaires, but yet there are no security cameras, neither inside nor outside the home. Sorry, my dog is drinking water now. This video is sponsored by Every Plate. Every Plate is under the umbrella of HelloFresh, so it's a meal kit delivery service, but it is pretty much the most affordable one on the market. I'm sure you guys have heard, this inflation is getting crazier by the minute. Eggs are like diamonds now, but the cool thing about Every Plate is that you're gonna get a consistent price. You're not gonna have to deal with that, and you're gonna get delivered delicious meals that are easy to prepare and you can customize them to your liking. If you have certain food preferences, you can do those if you want vegetarian, if you want more high protein, low carb, low calorie, high calorie, whatever you want. So new year, you know, same me, but also people are being healthier during the new year. And so they have this meal preference that's new now. It's called Nutrish and Delish. And it's exactly that. And it gives you 650 calorie or less meals. Sometimes people think if they have to eat healthy, it's going to be expensive. But with every plate, it's not. It's affordable. Actually, it is the 56% cheaper than all other leading meal kits. So you get so much bang for your buck. It's actually the best value meal kit in America. And... <laughs> 
I'm doing low carb right now and I love the options they gave me. This beef was so delicious with the ponzu and the pickled cucumbers and the horseradish aioli. Oh my God, it was so good. So if you're interested, you can get started with every plate for just $1.39 per meal by going to everyplate.com and entering the code NOOR139. That's $1.39 per meal by going to everyplate.com and entering the code NOOR139. They don't have any security cameras. It's like, it's weird, right? The other thing too is that police are starting to operate on this theory that it was a murder-suicide. Why? Because they didn't see any signs of forced entry. They felt like Honey had more bruises on her face, face than Barry did. And I guess based on that, that's what they thought. The police then began retracing the Sherman's last steps. So the last time the Shermans were seen alive was on December 13th, 2017, which was two days before they were actually found. And they were at the Apotex headquarters. They had a meeting with these home builders because they were selling this home that they were found in, but they were planning on building another home on a plot of land. So they were meeting with these builders to discuss these plans. And Honey left the offices first at 5.30 and she went home. Barry left after her like a couple hours. He stayed at the office, did a bit more work, and then he came after her. 6.20, uh, about an hour after um, Honey leaves the office, her iPhone has a phone call, a five minute phone call with her friend. Her friend seemed that she seemed fine, said that she seemed fine, and then that was the last time anyone ever spoke to Honey. Now, according to where Honey's car was, she entered through the main floor. Like that's what the investigators are thinking because she parked on the main floor. There was like an unlocked door there. That's where she entered. The weird thing is her iPhone was found in the guest bathroom on that same floor, which she never uses. Like everyone who knows her says she, she never goes in there. So why was she there? People are like, was she hiding? Was there an intruder? And then she like ran in there hiding with her phone or something. The next thing we know is that nobody hears from Honey. Starting from December 14th, like that next morning, until the day her body was discovered, she got 10 missed calls. Based on that, police think something happened to them that night of the 13th. Barry, so when he comes home, he actually comes home through the underground garage. In the underground garage, there's like a side door that's also unlocked where someone could have entered. So he comes in through there and he had these really important papers that he promised he was going to bring home that night and he also was wearing like his gloves. Now those two items were found on the ground near a staircase that leads to the pool area where their bodies were found. The realtor, not realizing the significance, picked both up and put them on a knee-high ledge in the hallway. It leaks to the news media that the police are operating on the theory that Barry did this. And the children, Barry and Honey's children, are very upset. They come out and they make a statement. We're shocked and think it's irresponsible that police sources have reportedly advised the media of a theory which neither their family, their friends, nor their colleagues believe to be true. The son, he tells police that his father and mother have a lot of enemies. That his parents were complicated people and there, there are people out there who would have a grudge against them and would have a reason to hurt them. He described his father as brilliant but lacking in emotional and social intelligence and he said his mother was smart, abrasive, and high energy. Let's talk about Barry and Honey's enemies because there's one particular one where something happened the day they were last seen alive. Okay, the day they were last seen alive, Barry's lawyers filed an aggressive motion, is how it's described, in a lawsuit that he had with someone who had scammed him, a fraudster. And this guy's name is Sean Rutenberg. Now, Sean basically scammed Barry for $150,000. Canadian dollars and the way he did it is basically he had this app. Why did I say it like that? App. App. Calm down. It's a trivia app where you could win cash prizes and so Barry donates this money to invest in this app but then later on basically long story short he finds out that this guy Sean 
didn't take this money to invest in that, but actually was using it for personal use. So he's pissed. And seven months before he's found dead is when he filed the lawsuit. The day he was actually killed, his lawyer filed a motion to the court, which basically asked the court to speed up the process to get the case to trial. Sean was actually arrested in June of 2017. Sean was in jail from June to January. So he was in jail when they were killed, but could he have hired someone? We don't know because here's the deal. Why was he in jail? Barry Sherman had something to do with that because actually Sean had scammed two girls that he was dating and it was like a criminal case against him. And Barry went and testified and gave a statement to police, which helped put Sean in jail because he was already mad at him about the scamming. And so he, he kind of cooperated with police to get Sean in jail. But that's not the only enemy that the Shermans had. So it all goes back to how Barry became a billionaire. Okay, BBB, blah, blah, blah. Uh, what? Shut up. What? <laughs> Kill yourself, bitch. The way Barry became a billionaire was his uncle had like this small pharmaceutical company. And when his uncle died, and Barry used to work for his uncle, when his uncle died, he bought out the company. Then, not long after that, he ends up selling that company and starting Apotex. Apotex is the huge, giant pharmaceutical company where he got all his billions from. That's still active today. They're like the biggest producer of generic uh, drugs, big pharma. They don't like that. And so a lot of the lawsuits that Barry had were with these huge pharmaceutical companies that were suing him for making generic versions and more affordable versions of his their medications. The thing is though, Barry used to talk about the fact that he was surprised that he wasn't killed already because he felt like these pharma people were out to get him. We know in federal court alone that there were more lawsuits involving Barry Sherman and his competition than anybody else in, in Canada. One of the strategies of Barry Sherman was to get all the law firms here in Toronto locked up so the competition couldn't have those good law firms. He was the biggest and the most successful and had made a lot of enemies and was extremely litigious and was continuing to be so, didn't care about making friends, didn't care about making peace with anybody. He was gonna win at all costs. Well, there was a name brand company in Europe that actually discussed uh, putting him in compromising positions, planting cocaine on him, you know, uh, compromising sexual positions, that kind of thing. And when that didn't work, they actually hired spies to go to the picnic tables at Apotex, dress up as workers and talk to employees to try and get dirt on Barry Sherman. He, in his paranoia, wondered if maybe somebody should have knocked him off by now, because that would have ended the whole problem for the other side. He said, for $1,000, you can probably get somebody killed. He also had beef and legal lawsuits with family members. So remember how I told you he worked for his uncle's pharmaceutical company and then he bought it out? Well, that uncle had kids, the winter siblings, okay? When their father died and Barry bought their father's company. A month later, their mother died and they became orphans. And they were under the impression that there was like a clause in the purchase. When Barry purchased their father's company, they thought they were going to get like guaranteed jobs in the company and a certain amount of shares in the company. And that this was like their birthright, their inheritance, their orphan now. They end up actually getting adopted by another family. They don't ever get shares to the business. They don't ever work like they're working regular jobs. And Barry has now sold their dad's company, started this new company, and he's like a billionaire. And they feel like they've been robbed and cheated out of basically their money, their inheritance, whatever. The siblings sue Barry in 2007. And this is like a decade long lawsuit that lasted up until and past Barry's death. They wanted 20% of Apotex. And actually there was like a crazy huge development leading up to Barry's death. Two months before Barry's death, the judge was like, no, this is an abusive process. Like you, you don't have any rights to this company. Like not only did he dismiss the lawsuit, but he told them they owed Barry Sherman $8 million. So it's two months before Barry died. Well, a week before Barry died, the judge ordered them to pay $300,000 in legal fees. Now, there's one particular sibling. His name is Carrie Winters. I think it's Winter. I don't know why I'm adding an S. But Cousin Carrie, that's what we'll call him. Cousin Carrie is 
kind of crazy. He basically <sighs> admits to like wanting to kill Barry, hates Barry. Like, so let's start in the beginning. Okay, let me let me give it to you in the timeline because when they were found dead, cousin Carrie comes out and he says, Barry asked me to kill his wife, honey, back in the 90s. And out of the blue, he looked at me and said, you know, sometimes I want to kill that he says, could you do it? I said, oh, come on, baby. You're not going to take out the mother of your kids. He says, why not? And he was dead serious. And I made a call knowing that my friend Louie could easily set it up because he was a quasi gangster. And he said, the body will go missing. There's not going to be a bullet in the back of the head or a car exploding. She's going to go missing. Ah, I've changed my mind. You know, you're right. I'm taking out my wife. You know, it's not a good thing. He f hated her. That's the truth. Barry Sherman hated honey. I believe Barry killed her, freaked out, and said, my God, what do I do now? Well, I know. We'll hold hands with ropes around her neck or belts, and we'll go by the swimming pool. And it'll look like we did it together. So there's no doubt in my mind he killed her. Cousin Carrie ends up taking a lie detector test on camera to prove that these allegations that he's making are true. And... So he ends up failing it, and that was very awkward. Are you lying when you say that Barry Sherman told you that you wanted his wife killed? No. And Carrie Winter what that failed. Means, there's so something I failed. That, yeah, you failed. Yeah, you failed. Winter seemed shaken, all of which begs another question. Could Carrie Winter have murdered the man he readily admits he hated so much? I probably had reasons to lash out, to... Uh, to do the dirty deed. He works as a construction site supervisor, a far cry from the wealth and power his billionaire cousin Barry Sherman enjoyed. And Carrie Winter is bitter. He cared about one thing, money, making lots of it, and not caring who he destroyed. I was betrayed. My cousin hurt me, and now I want to hurt him. Did you kill Honey and Barry Sherman? Absolutely not. Toronto police have asked him to come in for an interview. Winter says they told him he is not a suspect. He was also asked to take a lie detector test about whether he killed Barry, and his lawyer advised him not to do it, so he didn't. But the thing is, he said so many crazy things. He said, like, that, you know, he had opportunity to do it, that he didn't have an alibi. I want to read you some quotes from, from Cousin Carrie, okay? I would talk about killing Barry, and it was very graphic. He would come out of the parking lot of Apotex, and I'd be hiding behind a car, and I'd just decapitate him. I wanted to roll his head down the parking lot, and I'd sit there and wait for the police. Then he says that no one can verify where he was on the night of the killings, December 13th. He said no, no alibi. He said that he went to a Cocaine Anonymous meeting, and then he went home and fell asleep. But he also said it would be very easy for me to have left work at any time because I'm not on the clock. I could have easily driven over to their home and did the deed. I admit to that, but I didn't. I didn't, and that's why I'm not nervous. And that brings me back to the narrow-minded vision that the police had. Because remember, early on in the investigation, police came out and said there are no suspects, there are no signs of forced entry. We did not observe any signs of uh, forced entry to the to the building, um, and so uh, at this point. Uh, indications are that we have no outstanding suspect to uh, be going after. And so they didn't really look for other suspects. It ends up getting leaked, okay, that the police are operating on a theory that Barry did this and Barry and Honey's kids are pissed. The kids hire like a private investigation team and it's not any private investigation team. They spent millions, they get like top former homicide detectives. They get like the best forensics people, the best lawyers, like just this dream team. And this investigation was so damning for the police that at the end, the police end up flipping their whole thing to follow what the private investigator said. It was just so embarrassing. So let me, let me just tell you what the private investigation found, okay? The first thing is they have like this former chief of forensics pathologist who does like studies, like just the top person to perform an autopsy. They get this doctor and they have them perform a, a second autopsy on Barry and Honey. And he determines that it's very obviously a double homicide. First of all, he finds evidence that their hands were bound 
tightly, but that at the scene there were no rope or anything that could have been used. And so it was clear that they were bound and this was done to them. And then later on, everything was removed to sort of stage it, to, to give the illusion that maybe Barry had done it, which the police fell for. Then there was this whole issue with the hyoid bone where, uh, like the old science believes that, uh, if you do a suicide, you don't break it, but if it's a murder, you do break it because usually they press really, really hard when someone's trying to murder you. But this particular doctor that's performing the autopsy had done an academic paper, a whole study that proved that you you could still, like the breaking, whether the hyoid bone was breaking or, oh my God, I can't talk, the hyoid bone was breaking, whether the hyoid bone was broken or not did not determine whether it was a murder or not. And so based on the fact that their hands were bound and all this other stuff, it, the hyoid bone doesn't mean they weren't killed. And then the private investigators come in and they find that because the police were so gung-ho on their original theory, they did not collect fingerprints. There were like 25 palm prints that were not collected. They didn't collect DNA from anyone who was in contact with the Shermans the day they died. They also are supposed to like vacuum the floors and stuff to get hair or fibers or anything that could lead them to a potential perpetrator. But because they thought they knew who it was, Barry, they didn't do any of that. Then they didn't question people, witnesses, people who were across the street, around the house at the time. All this stuff, the realtors, they didn't even question the realtors for weeks. And they were there, they were the ones that discovered the body. So it was like they, thought they knew what happened and nothing could change that. The lawyer that the family hired as part of this investigation, he tells the media the, all this stuff about like the autopsy and what they didn't do and all this and it becomes like the front page news. And what do you think the police do? So at first they were invited, the police were invited to the second autopsy and they declined, they didn't wanna go. But then when all this was released to the media, the police called that doctor who performed the second autopsy and asked him to show them the, the autopsy that they were invited to and declined going. And then we're like, oh, okay, we, we accept. And then they like had a press conference the next day being like, it's a double homicide. We have sufficient evidence to describe this as a double homicide investigation and that both Honey and Barry Sherman were in fact targeted. Keep in mind, when they finally say this is double homicide, it's been five weeks since the murders and so much information has not been collected. So much stuff has been compromised. Like the investigation was bungled, as they say, and it was all because they were so narrow-minded, they couldn't really see past their theory. Now, here's like the most random thing ever, and I'm just gonna mention it because I can't not. There's this huge scandal in Apotex. McLean's has uncovered a lawsuit involving Apotex, filed just months before the murder of billionaire Barry Sherman. It alleges a longtime chemist went rogue and got caught with trade secrets the company deemed of enormous value. So back in January, Apotex was tipped off that a veteran chemist who had worked at Apotex for over a decade, um, had been siphoning trade secrets mm -hmm. via USB um, ports, trade secrets equaling, you know, millions, 300, some 300 millions of dollars were being siphoned off. And this fellow was planning to set up and had in fact set up a rival pharmaceutical company in his native Pakistan. Apotex went after him hard because they, they even asked a judge to put him in jail until he got all the info. <laughs> That's right. To remember that this is one of the most litigious companies, if not the most litigious company in Canada. It this lawsuit was launched uh, months before the murder. Is, is this gentleman being investigated at all in relation to the uh, homicide? We didn't get an, a definitive answer on that from Toronto police. Later in the year, Apotex itself is, became embroiled in a lawsuit with its president. Espionage. So there were certainly dramatic developments into the investigation into the deaths of Barry and Honey Sherman. More drama. The CEO of the company that Sherman uh, uh, founded 
He resigned just hours ahead of the police news conference. Jeremy Desai uh, had resigned as the president and CEO of Apotex. Certainly the timing's raising eyebrows. A spokesperson for Apotex declined comment. Desai had been wrapped up in a legal dispute with rival drug company Teva Pharmaceuticals over claims that a romantic relationship led to an alleged leak of trade secrets. So it just adds to all the intrigue surrounding this case. Wow. And the reason why I mention this is some people start thinking that maybe it was a disgruntled employee or someone who felt like maybe their job was about to be over or something like that. I'm not sure. The next thing that happened was, uh, what was the next thing that happened? What was that? There seems to be a break in the case. Police have identified a person of interest in the murder investigation. That person has not been publicly identified. So the weird thing here is they identify this person of interest, they don't arrest him, they don't name them, and nothing really comes of it. Then, in 2021, the police hold this press conference and they release video of who they believe the murder suspect is. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Brandon Price. I am a detective sergeant with the Toronto Police Service Homicide Squad. I'm not going to uh, say exactly the time of uh, this clip, but I will say it is in the evening or night hours of December 13th, 2017, the way in which they kick up their right foot with every step. This individual walks into that area, does not continue to walk through, but remains in that area that's not covered by uh, video footage, and then comes back out uh, some time later. It's very difficult to say with any level of certainty whether this is a male or a female, so I, I wouldn't declare one or the other at this point. According to police, they said that they believe the suspect is between five foot six and three quarter inches and five foot nine and a half inches. We have this individual coming into a very defined area around the Sherman household and remaining in that area for a period and then leaving from that area. It is a very suspicious amount of time and is in line with our belief as to when these murders took place. The latest on the case happened late last year, so like a couple months ago. First, the de lead detective who's on the case full time said that the case has now taken an international flair, is what they said, that they've gone to five countries, but they couldn't say like, where the countries, like which countries and why, because they didn't want to compromise the investigation, but that it could have an international element to it. So a year or so after the murders had happened, the family put a $10 million reward. But just recently in, I think, December of 2022, yes, they added 25 million to that. So now it's a $35 million reward. So those are the facts now. Let's discuss the theories. So this is for those of you that like the hat, although it seems like most of you hate it and have been bearing with me because you like me despite it, but I don't know. The first theory I wanna talk about is Big Pharma because when you go online, this is like the most like, uh, what's the word? Not controversial, but like heated, like people get really heated about this part of it uh, because some people are like, this is ridiculous, like you sound crazy. And then other people are like, can't you see? This is, well, can't you see? You're blind. Barry has said before that he is surprised he hasn't been taken out yet by these pharmaceutical companies. But also it's the timing of it that makes me think it might not be that likely because at the time he wasn't like very active, at least in running that business as he was before. However, he was still very litigious and had all these lawsuits. It could be someone from the past who had a grudge. There was a lawsuit going on against Apotex, but it was to the current CEO. Barry had nothing to do with that. And then the things that he had in the past, they seemed they were settled and done, or were they? As for what is more recent, what, what someone could have like a, a grudge, a vendetta, it was really two people that stick out. One was the fraudster that he sued, Sean Rutenberg, who he testified against and put a statement and kind of put him in jail. But then his alibi is kind of like he was in jail, so he maybe didn't do it physically, but could he have had someone else do it? The private investigators felt like it was more than one person who killed them, like it was at least two, maybe more. And so was it like a hit? Could Sean have ordered the hit? Could some big pharma company have ordered the hit? You know, that video footage the, that the police released of the suspect, that is just one person walking. And there is one person who really doesn't like Barry, who very recently was 
ordered like not just to pay eight million but then the three hundred thousand and there's like an anger emotional anger and who doesn't have an alibi who said themselves they don't have an alibi and that is cousin carrie there was this other thing that came out when the police were doing the investigation that honey's sister said in her second interview with police honey sherman's sister mary schechtman suggested the person responsible for the murders was quote making a statement and that she believed the motive for the killings may have been motivated by religion the shermans were strong supporters of israel and honey was very vocal about being jewish schechtman said there were a lot of people of a certain ethnicity going through the house at a certain time and honey would use phrases that were not politically correct you know the housekeeper was there first and um could the housekeeper have done it but the thing is like she's the one who said hey the security system was disarmed which is a huge thing right the security system was disarmed maybe they disarmed it after why would they disarm it after the deed's been done did they disarm it before if they disarmed the system before were they lying in wait for the shermans who could have had access to come in and disarm the system is it someone who they knew close? Why was the security system disarmed? And the housekeeper said in three years she worked there, she had never once seen it disarmed. When she came on the 15th, it was disarmed. Why? How? Who? Seems personal, right? If it was just about Barry and his business, would they have included his wife? Like maybe if they wanted to get back in, or maybe she just happened to be there because she came home first. But could it also have been a personal thing? So I would love to know what you guys think. Please tell me in the comments below. Let me know. Thank you guys so much for watching. Thank you to Every Plate for sponsoring this video. And thank you guys for watching. I think I said that already. Oh my God. See you in the next one. Bye.